thanks for coming out tonight, everybody. I'm excited to have uh, Del Hero here tonight. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about um, his work and his projects and um, his career, and uh, maybe a little bit in relation to what we have set up over in, in the gallery. And um, that's uh, his design that the 3D design students executed over in the gallery. So we'll go over afterwards and see that, have some refreshments and so on. Um, I'll give you an opportunity to ask questions directly to Dell if you like, or just chat with him a little bit. Um, but by way of introduction, Dell comes to us from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, he has his um, BFA from Oregon State University. Is that correct? Or Oregon. University, yeah. University of yeah. Oregon, sorry. Yeah. Um, University the of Oregon. The ducks. <laughs> the mighty Ducks. Yeah. Um, and uh, his MFA from Alfred University, which is where I met Dell. Um, he was a year above me in graduate school. Um, so I got to know Dell quite well during graduate school and um, have maintained a relationship with him since then. And I'm always just extremely impressed with the caliber of his work and um, the kind of uh, itinerary that his. Um, career has. You know, reading his resume it takes a long time. There's a lot of lines in there and a lot of shows, um, but most recently uh, he just came to us actually from almost directly from Kansas City where he set up a show at a place called Hawk Contemporary. Um, he's also shown at the Denver Art Museum and um, numerous other venues, uh, too many to list, but um, he's uh, working a lot with um, digital design and fabrication technologies and uh, about um, four years ago, I spent a semester out in Fort Collins with Dell, and that's really where I began to learn a little bit about um, CNC fabrication. Um, was working with Dell and his machine out there. Um, so, continuing that relationship is really exciting, and I'm really happy that he could come and uh, close out this show for us. Uh, so, I'll turn it over to Dell. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Lee. Um, thanks for having me out. Um, and uh, for all your work uh, putting together the show over in the gallery, I just saw it, um, saw it all set up just now, and it looks really exciting over there. And thank you guys all um, for coming, and I think many of you guys, maybe most of you guys, are in the 3D design class that worked on putting all that stuff together. So um, thank you in advance uh, for... Uh, I'm going to record this. I forgot. Push the button. All right, Robbie, we need you. Okay, I got it. You got it? I think so. Okay. So thank you guys for all your work on that project, and um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys more about that during the opening and um, hear, you know, some of your thoughts and impressions and feelings, um, having kind of gone through the process of sticking all those parts together. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today about a few different things. Um, I... Uh, you know, I'm an artist, but I'm also a teacher. I'm a professor at Colorado State University, as we said. And um, so I'm kind of involved in a number of different projects at different scales, um, uh, projects both connected to my teaching, um, but also um, uh, projects uh, that kind of deal with sort of larger um, ideas around digital fabrication and technology and ceramic sort of at the intersection of the fields of art, architecture, and design. And as an artist, like, kind of what's really exciting to me is um, getting to really, like, move back and forth between these projects, like the one that you guys were working on here, that really involve a lot of collaboration um, with other people, and um, bouncing ideas off of people, and kind of creativity in this really shared um, kind of communal space. And then moving from there to the more like really kind of private, um, immediate space of the studio, of my own studio. And I'm really, I get really excited about the ways that working in those different spaces provoke different kinds of thinking. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk through a few of these different projects and then kind of move into um, the sort of core of my studio practice and talk to you about some of the shows I've had recently and some of the projects I've worked on recently. Um, but as Lee said, I, I teach at um, Colorado State University, 
Um, I teach in a few areas there. Um, I teach in the pottery area and the sculpture area. I teach in the sculpture area with my wife, Sanam Amami. She's a really talented potter. This is some of her work, these tulip ear forms. Um, I also um, uh, have really worked on um, starting this area for digital fabrication at Colorado State University. Um, but I'm kind of have my hand in a lot of different projects. So these are just a few images from a, a kiln building project I've been working on for the last few years of designing and building some gas kilns that are actually all controlled with computers. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, we can talk about that more later. Um, the digital fabrication area, I wanted to talk a little bit about that kind of lab at CSU. And so getting that kind of up and running has been a big... Um, sort of a uh, big component of, of my work at CSU. Um, when uh, So all these tools, I've been at CSU for about five years, and all these tools are kind of new in the time I've been there, and they've come together through a whole range of different funding sources. But we're at the point where we have a pretty comprehensive digital fabrication lab now. So this is a room with... Um, a couple of laser cutters in it. Um, we've got uh, a CNC, a couple of CNC milling machines, kind of like what you guys have here. Um, we've got a 3D printer and a bunch of other things there. Um, we've also done a lot of work um, putting together a website um, for this fab lab that really helps students and faculty across the university figure out how to use and access these tools. So we've got tutorials up online. And, um, and uh, you know, we just kind of talk about access procedures on this website. Um, this is a new big CNC milling machine that we're about to get up and running. We're pretty excited about it. It actually has, a, you guys have a three, what's called a three-axis CNC milling machine, so it basically moves back and forth, left to right, and up and down. And this one has an additional axis where you can like plug your part into this turntable, and it'll also like turn a part around as you're milling it. So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, and then we just got this space online um, at the beginning of this last academic year, and this, you know, along with the tools and um, our really amazing shop technician in the lab. Um, I think this space is probably one of the most significant things that's happened for us. And it's basically a computer lab that's entirely dedicated to the digital fabrication tools and software. And for a long time, we were sort of running the lab just using laptops that we would check out to students. Um, and it's so interesting what happens when you establish a physical space like this where you guys can come in and work together. You know, I think we kind of live in this era where more and more in education, we're moving towards things like online education, you know, the idea that you can kind of get the content anywhere you are. And I think that those ideas um, tend to be really pushed forward in areas like new media and digital technology. Um, but I'm really, really a deep believer in the importance of the kind of culture and learning that happens in the physical classroom space, right? So it's kind of, a, a, feels like a little bit of a paradox in a way. So this is this classroom where all the students can come in and work individually on computers, um, but you're all in the same room, right? And I think there's something really, really important that comes out of that. So even though it's working with digital technology, you get some of these benefits of the kind of studio culture that you see in the ceramics departments and sculpture areas and kind of traditional art studios. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, digital fabrication the last, maybe for the last 10 years or so, and specifically kind of how we take these new tools and integrate them within um, a kind of you know, traditional art curriculum. And um, so like getting the tools into a department, right? Getting a CNC milling machine is kind of one part of that. But then there's this whole other really complicated set of questions about how you actually teach through these tools, teach using these tools. And um, 
I think there are like so many different ways to think about this. And so as a way of kind of starting that project of thinking through these ideas, um, we were able to put together this program that's allowed us to invite in um, artists for one semester each to teach a course in digital fabrication. And when they come in, I've just told them, you know, you can teach anything you want, you just have to use this tool set, um, and you have to introduce the students to all these different things, like the CNC milling machine, you know, the 3D printer, the laser cutter, things like that. So. Um, we've had this really amazing um, group of artists and designers come in to teach these classes and each of them really approaches the class in a really different way. So Lee Summers was actually our first friends and fellow for Digital Craft and he and I kind of co-taught a class together. Um, you guys know quite a bit about his work so I won't tell you so much about his work but I'll tell you about some of the other people um, we've brought in for the program. Um, so the, the second um, friends and fellow we had in was an artist named Andy Brayman. Um, this is uh, a piece of his. Andy's really, in many ways, um, a kind of, he's a studio potter. So he makes functional pottery, right? But instead of using the potter's wheel or building things by hand, he's using computers and digital tools to create these functional forms. So this is a slip cast base that he made but the mold for this base was um, carved on a CNC milling machine, very similar to the one you have. The forms of his bases are actually also created using these really complex computer algorithms. So he gathers data um, and then uses that data to generate shape. So the form of this base was actually created um, by, was determined by the change in the level of the river outside of the studio where he happens to have his studio space, where he, ha he happens to work. Um, Andy is a real kind of tinkerer, tooling tinkerer kind of guy, so he not only uses um, existing digital fabrication tools, he also does a lot of work with customizing machines and building his own machines. So this is a a kind of system he made that plugs into, it hooks up to a CNC milling machine like the one you guys have, but uh, what it does is it decorates on these plates with overglaze, so with the ceramic material. And it gets at this really interesting potential of digital fabrication, you know, which is that you, with traditional industrial tools, um, there, there's this kind of trade-off between the benefits of the tools, which mean you can make, which have contributed to like making things really efficiently, like you can make a lot of things with machines, right? But historically, um, when you move to a more industrial mechanized process, what you lose is the ability to customize shapes, right? So digital fabrication tools present this really unique kind of new paradigm where you get both the precision of machines, right, and the speed of machines that you've had historically, but you can also make every single object unique. So this machine really kind of gets into that. It's like you can have a machine that decorates all of these different plates. You could have a thousand different plates, and every single one of them can be different but in a really, really precise way. Um, the second Friends and Fellow that we had in was an artist named Stacy Jo Scott, or the third Friends and Fellow actually, and she was a recent graduate from Cranbrook Academy of Art. Um, and instead of, so where Andy was really interested in kind of working with the students and the tools, um, Stacy Jo was really kind of, is really interested in her practice in these kind of broader um, conceptual and theoretical implications around digital fabrication tools. So she did a lot of reading in the course. It was really kind of a theory-based class when she taught the class. Um, and then the most recent um, uh, people we had in to teach this course were um, uh, this uh, pair of collaborators. Um, they're also a husband and wife team, Dries Verbruggen and Claire Vernier. Um, they came from Belgium, and they collaborate in this um, design practice called Unfold Design. 
and um, they were educated at this really important um, design school in Holland uh, called Eindhoven. Which a lot of famous designers came out of that school, um, Drogue Design, Hella Jungarius um, went through this program. And they have this really, really wide-ranging um, design practice, which I think looks a little bit different from what we might typically think of as industrial design. Um, they really uh, it contains some of the like problem-solving aspects of design that we kind of as would associate with design, I think. But then there's also another part of their practice that's really playful. Um, so this was a machine that they built. Um, it's basically a modified 3D printer um, that prints with a porcelain slip. So it's a machine for directly printing ceramic objects. Um, and they've done a number of different pieces, kind of playing with this one tool. Um, these are some interesting experiments with making filters out of ceramics. And um, this is a place where they're really kind of exploring the potential of this tool that might be really unique, right? Like it would be really hard to make some of these forms with this really intri intricate, complex interior structure with traditional building techniques or traditional mold making techniques. Um, I put together an exhibition a few years ago um, out at uh, Alfred University in Western New York where Lee and I went to grad school and where we met. Um, it was all about um, artists using digital fabrication in conjunction with ceramics and we brought uh, Dries out there for that show and um, he taught a two-day workshop, and we did all these really interesting experiments with printing in the studio, and we were doing things like um, students would like pinch the bottom of a form, and then Dries would print the rest of a shape on top of the object. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about their, the way they're working um, is they're really interested in some of these, like, you know, the kind of aberrations, the variations, like the mistakes that machines make. So we usually think of like digital fabrication as a way of achieving a really precise, repeatable um, result. And they're actually interested in the aesthetic potential of the problems with machines. I think is a pretty fascinating idea. Um, this is just one more project of Dries and Claire's that's one of my favorites. Um, so a lot of their work sort of circles around issues related to 3D printing, um, both practical and kind of conceptual issues. And this was a piece that they made for the Design Biennial in London a number of years ago. And what this is, is it's a 3D printing portable kiosk. It's like a little push cart, right, where you'd sell like souvenirs or hot dogs or something. It's equipped with a 3D scanner and a 3D printer. And what they did was they took this push card around the biennial and they scanned other artists' designs and they copied them and then they sold them like little tchotchkes out of the push card. <coughs> and um, they actually, it was really interesting, they actually won one of the prizes from the design biennial for this project. Um, but there was this big uh, controversy at the end, and um, so for the awards ceremony, um, the organizers wanted them to show the kiosk, but they said they couldn't show any of the things they made in the kiosk, so it might upset the other designers. But that was pretty good. Um, so, along with these um, visiting artists we've had in to teach digital fabrication at CSU, um, I have also taught this class a number of times. I've taught it in a few different ways. Um, most recently I taught the digital fabrication class last semester, and um, we ran it as a really um, project-specific kind of design-build course. Um, so we were working the whole semester with this project, um, this is a, a project called the Artstream Nomadic Gallery. Um, an artist named Allegheny Meadows, who's based in Aspen, Colorado, um, has been running this project for about 15 years. And um, this project involves this Airstream trailer that he bought, and he turned the interior into a gallery for ceramic objects. 
um, and then he's taken this all over the country and um, sets it up. You know, he sets it up at the Ansika conference every year, which is the big national ceramics conference. And he takes it to the farmers market in Aspen every weekend during the summer. And um, it's basically this nomadic, this traveling gallery selling some of the nicest functional studio ceramics being made in the U.S. today. Um, the art stream is, was kind of getting on its last legs, this particular trailer, so the interior is getting beat up and um, the, the trailer is getting kind of old. So Allegheny bought a new trailer and he asked us through this course to design and build a new interior for the trailer. Um, so we spent the whole semester with a group of students working on this design build project. Um, the first thing we did was we decided if we're going to build it, we should first make a model. So we made a model of the whole Airstream shell. Um, we, uh, for, the first, for the first assignment, all of the students basically modeled a trailer and then figured out how to unfold it into a pattern. And then we took it down to this water jet cutter on campus, the same place where all those aluminum parts uh, down in the gallery were water jet cut. And we had all of the pieces, so basically this unfolded pattern for an Airstream trailer. We had it water jet cut, and then we um, assembled it into this model um, that's about four or five feet long. And then we used this basically as a shell to put all of our designs in for the semester. So this is one of the designs we worked on. And the final um, product ended up being something pretty similar to this. It's basically this slotted structure with these different levels of shelves kind of moving around the interior of the trailer space. One of the things that I think is really exciting about digital fabrication technology is the potential it opens up for many people to basically collaborate on one form. And this is an idea that's really been explored really thoroughly, like in architecture, for example. That's one of the big reasons why architects like this kind of software and technology, is it allows lots and lots of people to all work together on a really, really complex model. Um, so this is the model um, kind of towards the end of the semester that basically 15 students in this class were all collaborating on one design and everybody can get in there and modify little parts. Everybody's working on one little piece of it, but it comes together as a whole. Um, this just gives you a sense of the scale of one of the models of the piece. And then we actually moved into producing this trailer interior at full scale. So the class covered along with um, you know, all of the software and, and kind of digital design, we also had to get into all of these like, you know, really practical kind of like woodworking techniques, like figuring out how materials work, which is all stuff that you guys, you know, it's like that back and forth that you guys really got into this semester in the 3D design class, where it's one thing to model something in the computer, but then when you actually make it out of physical material and physical space, you have to think about the design in a completely different way. So here's part of that design kind of coming together. And um, unfortunately, I don't have a finished um, image of the whole installation. Um, this is a, a really a talented student um, in our program right now. She's actually a, it's called a special student in the pottery area. So she's already done a degree. And then she's come to CSU to kind of work with specifically our ceramics program and some of the digital fabrication tools we have. And um, uh, her name is uh, Camila Friedman Gerlitz, and she actually was the TA for this class. And she has a really interesting background um, where she actually was in a PhD program for mathematics before she decided to um, come back to working with clay. Um, but she has really kind of this ideal mind for working back and forth between art and software. Um, and this is a little project um, that uh, Camila made actually during the semester. It was a little installation for our digital fabrication classroom where she made this big shelving system, this kind of niche that was left in the wall. So 
There's also all, all the CNC cut plywood and slotted you know, structure. So, <coughs> with this whole kind of world of digital technology in relation to actually making art, um, I think often, you know, technology, when we kind of talk about technology in our culture, it sort of seems like it justifies itself, right? And I think usually when people talk about like why, why we have these new tools, you know, or why we have any piece of technology, it basically comes down to a few reasons, right? A few things. So usually people are talking about speed, efficiency, scalability, right? This is why like capitalism likes technology. Right? It makes it more efficient to make things more quickly. I think as an artist, we have the opportunity to think about this technology in kind of fundamentally different ways, right? It's not all about speed, efficiency, scalability. And so what I end up thinking a lot about is kind of the way the machines, the way tools, the way technology have their own character, their own aesthetic character. I get really interested in these things. So rather than just kind of the functional, pragmatic outcomes of technology, um, the aesthetics of the digital technology itself. And I'll talk a little more about what I mean by that as we kind of move forward. Um, I think there are a few sort of thinkers um, that have been really seminal for me in you know, thinking through how um, digital tools relate to my practice. And um, one of them is uh, this artist, a woodworker, and also a scholar named David Pye. And um, he wrote this really seminal essay called The Nature and Art of Workmanship. And this essay really delves into this kind of fundamental relationship between handmade things and machine-made things. And I think we often think of those two ideas as a kind of binary relationship. So like something is either handmade or machine-made. Right? The, the kind of paradigm that Pi posits is that it's actually a continuum. So on one side of this continuum is this idea of the workmanship of risk. And that is basically all things that are made by hand with very little aid from tools, right? It involves a lot of skill, they involve a lot of manual coordination. And then on the other side is the workmanship of certainty. So he says basically all tools are some kind of prosthetic device, right? To supplement, um, to correct the little, the little variations of the hand. And um, in Pi's kind of paradigm, um, it talks about this idea that basically, you know, there are all of these reasons for making more and more things using the workmanship of, of certainty, so using more and more tooling, all of these kind of efficient, scalable, fast kinds of ideas. But he says that we also have a fundamental human need for things that are made by hand because it contributes to variation in material culture. And he says that's really important because it's kind of like the variation that we see in nature, right? We have this fundamental human need for variation, for difference, for different kinds of things, for variation both small and large. And then Pai talks about this idea specifically in relation to digital tools. Right? Because, like we sort of talked about earlier, we create this entirely new set of possibilities for creating different kinds of variation, potentially, um, from things that were historically made by hand. So I um, use both digital tools in my process, and then I also make many things by hand talk about this a little more as we go forward. And I think about this relationship in a couple of different ways. So on one hand, um, I'm really interested in the range of outcomes 
that are the byproduct of making things in different ways. The other thing that I get really interested in is the way I think that the way we make things influences the way we think about form. So when you make something using a different, different technique, I think you tend to think really differently in the space of the studio. Um, so I also tend to use a number of different materials in my practice, um, but in almost everything I make, ceramics is somewhere at the core. So clay is somewhere at the core. And it's at the core both as a material, um, but I also think there are a number of ideas that are really germane to ceramics as a material. And so I use, I tend to use not only the material, but also those ideas as a kind of starting point for generating work. So one of the ideas um, that I think of as being really sort of fundamental to ceramic work is the idea basically of making something big out of many small parts. And this idea, I think, really connects to the use of ceramics as a material in architecture, as an, at an architectural scale. There are all of these things about clay that are really, really good for like making buildings or making shelters. Like it's really permanent. It's a really, really good insulator. Um, on the other hand, you know, clay is pretty heavy, right? Um, it, it's really strong in one way, but when it fails, it fails catastrophically, right? So it doesn't bend like metal. It's not forgiving. It's like when it breaks, it breaks all at once. Um, you also need a kiln big enough to fire any individual component. Right? So it's like really cumbersome, like if you want to build a house out of clay, it's really cumbersome to like build a kiln big enough to put that whole house in. So for a long time, for actually thousands of years, artists have been thinking about ways of making interesting things out of clay through a lot of little components. And um, also, how to make something big that's interesting out of a lot of components that are actually repeated, so repeated shapes. So this is a really ex interesting example of that kind of idea. Um, this is a photograph of a, um, a, a shrine in Esfahan in Iran, and um, it's a tiling system. And in this tiling system, there are basically five units which repeat. Right? So there are five repeated units, but when they tile or tessellate together, they actually repeat, they, they tessellate together in a way that has no symmetry. So the shapes just keep growing in different ways. It grows kind of like a crystal. And this is this really complicated idea actually in mathematics um, that uh, mathematicians in the West actually didn't figure out in the, until the 1970s. And they were doing this, like basically a bunch of artists and craftspeople figured out this idea in Iran in 1453, basically as a way of covering the side of a building in an interesting way. So that kind of idea um, is really at the core of a whole number of projects that I've worked on. Basically that idea of thinking about geometry, but thinking about geometry through the properties of a material, of the ceramic material. So this is a shape that you guys have become really familiar with. Um, so in addition to shapes tessellating two-dimensionally, and basically tessellating just means shapes that go together without any void space in between them, um, there are also regular shapes which tessellate three-dimensionally. And this is one particular one. It's called a truncated octahedron. Um, so um, basically you can make a bunch of these shapes and stick them together and they'll build right out and out and out without any voids <laughs> in between them. Um, so I've done a number of pieces um, working basically with this shape. I came across this shape in a really kind of empirical way, basically just cutting little um, squares and hexagons out of foam core 
and taping them together and then starting to cast these out of clay. Um, so this is the first iteration of that project, um, which is down in the gallery um, in an entirely new configuration. Um, and uh, it's basically a bunch of components using these shapes that are made out of slip cast black porcelain. So I was really interested in working with the same shape, um, but in order to build a structure that had more porosity to it, so more open space kind of inside of it. So that first iteration, all of those black shapes were actually developed without the use of any kind of digital fabrication software at all. Um, in order to make this next project, I kind of moved back into the computer and um, Instead of using that truncated octahedron as a whole kind of volume, I just started with the edges of the form, right? And then started to build these um, kind of a shell or a network out from the edges. Then I used another software algorithm to basically take that really hard geometric shape and soften it into something more organic. and then applied another algorithm to it to basically break this up into segments. And so in this, I'm trying to find something that I can cast um, that will uh, function as a unit that when repeated, it'll basically build that overall structure. So the way the way I kind of tend to move from, with, with most of my work, the way I kind of move from the digital model into physical objects is through the use of a CNC milling machine, like you guys are using. Um, I, for most of these pieces, I'm casting um, out of porcelain, so I'm casting objects out of porcelain. And I found this really interesting kind of confluence of um, the lim basically the limitations of making a mold for slip casting with clay, where it meets in this really efficient way with the limitations of the CNC milling machine. So you guys have probably noticed already that um, when you're working with this three-axis milling machine, there are a lot of limits in terms of the kinds of forms you can make. Right? Like it's kind of hard to make a fully three-dimensional shape. Right? It's really good for like cutting out flat stock material. It's also really good for creating relief. Right? But because it only moves left to right, back and forth, and up and down, it doesn't turn and your part won't turn, it's kind of difficult to make a fully three-dimensional object. What's really interesting is that these limitations that the machine has in terms of creating a shape are exactly the same geometric limitations that one part of a mold has. Right? So when you're making a multi-part mold for an object, each of the parts needs to be able to pull directly away from a form. So each of the components basically can't have any undercuts. And this machine, by definition, also won't cut anything with undercuts. So the way I tend to work um, with a lot of these forms is rather than thinking about making a complete object, I think about using the CNC milling machine to mill the parts for the mold. So these are the five parts of a five-part mold, um, all milled out of foam. And then I pour plaster into those parts, into each of those um, uh, uh, foam parts. And then these are the five parts that come out of the foam in plaster. So basically you're milling the negative of a mold. And then you can take all of these mold parts and stick them together and pour casting slip into them. This is the slip casting process, just kind of sped up a little bit. Um, basically, for you guys who aren't familiar with this, you basically pour a liquid slip into the plaster mold and a thin shell of clay builds up on the sides of the mold. And you wait a little while. 
foot goes down, you pour this out, and you take the mold apart, um, and you have this piece. And it's really interesting that actually the first time you ever see the physical form out of the computer, it's actually when it comes out of the mold. So I can take all of these components now, and you can just paint a little bit of slip on them and stick them together, and basically build them back up into modules. So here I'm kind of looking for a module that's a good size to pick up and move around, and also a good size to go into a kiln, right? And then all of these parts are fired separately, and you can stack them up and they tessellate and grow on two axes. And this is what that piece looks like, kind of all put together. This is a third iteration of that kind of the sort of ongoing project, all using that same underlying geometry, right? That truncated octahedron. But here it's moving to an entirely different material. So this is basically the same idea. We'll kind of we can talk about this more down in the gallery space. But basically these polyhedrons um, have faces, which are either hexagons or squares. But here instead of thinking about the full face of those pieces kind of think about them as these sort of, like, um, what, the tree network, little node pieces. And so where the corners connect, they connect with rivets, and connecting the pieces together cause those surfaces to bend into these kind of spheres. And then when they connect together, the interiors of each of the faces have to kind of open up and so it creates this much more kind of complex, organic, sort of fluid shape when you start putting more and more and more of them together. What are we doing for time? It's about five minutes. About, about five two minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll just show you guys one more project. Um, so, as I said, I kind of think a lot about these ideas which are really sort of germane to ceramics as a material. Um, so that idea of repetition, um, tessellation, kind of tiling, I think is one of these. Another one is really, so the idea of the vessel, but the idea of the vessel is something that evolves over time through these kind of sequential um, morphological variations. So the idea that the forms of vessels kind of grow over time like a family tree. Um, this is a really interesting kind of chart from a book um, called Ceramics by Philip Rawson. Um, this is another um, set of charts which kind of explore that um, same idea, but from a really different angle. This is actually a, a study of, from a study of language um, and the relationship between language and objects. And so this was a study that this linguist did um, where he made all of these charts, and then he turned these charts into flashcards, basically. And he traveled around Mexico, and he went from village to village, and he would show people these flashcards, one after another. So he'd say, what do you call this thing? And what do you call this thing? And what do you call this thing? And then he would map where the name for an object changed from a cup to a vase. You know, or a base to a bowl. Um, so anyway, I think there's really this, there are all of these interesting relationships between this variation in ceramic form, the way we name things, right, and also the way we relate these forms um, to the form of our bodies, so the shape of our own bodies. Um, so this was a piece that I made kind of exploring all of these ideas. Um, this piece again, sorry, started off with a model in the computer. Um, this model originated from the profiles of these two historical forms. And um, with this project, I was really interested in this idea that potters <coughs> often talk about, which is the idea of the breadth of a pot. So potters often describe the different parts of a vessel um, in terms of their relationship to the human body, right? So you talk about the lip of a pot, 
the foot of a pot, the belly of a pot, the shoulder of a pot. And potters also talk about this idea of the breath of a pot, which I always felt like I kind of understood what that meant, you know? I think it means something about the overall kind of distribution of volume of a form. And so in a way I made this piece as a way of kind of thinking through that idea. Um, so the piece started with these two historical forms. One I thought really exemplified like a pot exhaling. The other one a pot sort of fully inhaling. And then I created this little computer algorithm which would morph the form back and forth. Right? To kind of turn it into something, um, to turn the pot from something fixed in a moment of breath to something dynamic, so something that was breathing or moving. Then what I wanted to do was to make a series of these vessel forms, so actually to turn that continuum into physical objects. And at first the way I thought I would do that was using basically the technique you guys just saw in the last project. So basically milling a mold for a mold on the CNC machine but making a bunch of those um, and then casting all of these forms. But as I started thinking more about it, I thought it would be really interesting to try to create a whole series of forms, but all from one mold. Um, so that's what that's kind of what happened. Um, so this is the first mold in the series, and basically what I did was I um, carved a mold on the milling machine and then cast a number of objects and then put the mold back on the CNC milling machine, cut more material away, and then cast forms again and just repeated this process over and over again. So this is the same mold kind of nearing the end of the process. Um, this is just a little video kind of showing you guys how this works. So it was a four-part mold. Um, before each form was cast, I basically put this mold back on the table. I made a little bed that would register all of the mold parts. And then the other component here was each time the mold was remilled, um, I changed the angle of the milling machine slightly. So you end up seeing in the final object the history of the machine kind of carving the mold away and passing over the form over and over again. Here are a bunch of these pieces being cast sitting in the studio. And then this is what this whole series of vessels ended up looking like. So all out of one mold moving from that object in the back to the form in the front. And then one of the other things that I get really kind of fascinated by, you know, it's like my work is really, I think, so much about this movement between the space of working in the computer and then working in physical materials. And often I find I become really captivated by the representation of form within the digital space. So I think there's something really beautiful often about it. You know, it's kind of like these studies in Renaissance perspective. It's like these Paolo Uccello drawings, right? Where there's this amazing kind of structure <coughs> to the way form is represented in the space of the screen. And with this project, I was really interested in bringing something of that out into the space of the gallery, the space of the exhibition. Um, but I didn't want to just make like a 3D print. I wanted to make something that really kind of retained that or um, that had the, that additional layer of physical kind of material um, interaction. Um, so this is basically a big drawing. Um, it's all of the CAD drawings for all ten of these shapes, basically stacked one on top of another. And then the drawing is ex actually executed um, with just a graphite pencil, but by making a little fixture that attaches the graphite pencil to the CNC milling machine. And um, it actually takes about five hours to execute this drawing. Basically just, you know, fairly quickly kind of draws this away. 
but then you have to stop every once in a while and sharpen the pencil and um, restart the machine. And so it's really, um, and you see all of this history of the pencil wearing away. Um, you see the history of, of the actual physical impression of the mark of the tool against the paper. And so these are a couple of images just of what this piece looks like installed. So it's this series of porcelain vessels, a video, and then this large drawing on the wall. And then there's one more image of the, um, another idea about um, kind of presentation for this piece. So I've made a series of five of these, and sometimes they go on tables, and sometimes they go on cabinets like this, cabinets like this. Okay. I have some more images, but I think I'll just stop there. We're about out of time. I'd like to open it up for questions for just a few minutes, and we can talk with Del more over in the gallery, of course, but if there's uh, something anybody wants to ask, just bring it to the... Yeah, in the back there. My question is, is this connected to fractal geometry in any way? Is well, that... that um, so I showed you guys the tiling system on the side of that shrine in Esfahan in Iran. And um, that uh, system, uh, which is called, that particular tiling system, which is actually called Penrose geometry, um, is actually connected to fractal geometry. Um, so um, basically that idea of, of uh, uh, geometry that's made out of repeated units, right? but in a way that um, doesn't repeat, right? Where the geometry itself kind of doesn't repeat. And it's really interesting, like in fractal geometry, one of the features is this idea called um, cross-scalar self-similarity, right? So it's like you see the big and the small and the small and the big, right? If you zoom in and out, you see the same patterns occurring at both of those scales. And the way that Penrose tiling works, it's kind of complicated, but basically the way it works, the way you derive these shapes, is actually through a similar process of scaling. So what you do is you take two polygons, so two different geometric shapes, and you make one bigger and one smaller, and then you use the little one to make the big one. And then you kind of cut a section out of each of those. It's sort of hard to describe. We need a chalkboard and some diagrams. And I probably don't believe and understand it completely either. So. But yes, that is related to fractal geometry. Any other questions? We can talk more over in the gallery. Go ahead, Andrew. Um, you explored with like the frame configuration like you were breaking down all those uh, polygons into basically a frame shape. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think of doing it where it's like the negative of that? Or it's basically the internal mass turning into an uh, organic kind of uh, structure? That's a great idea. Um, <laughs> That's basically what the aluminum piece is doing, actually. I mean, that piece is like the boundary, right, between the interior and exterior. So that's basically what it describes. It's like just the boundary without filling it on either side. Um, but that's, no, that's a really interesting idea. I like that a lot, actually. Um, I'm going to take that one. <laughs> Is that okay? I'll credit you. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs>